Hello, everyone, and welcome to Registrar Corp's webinar entitled U.S. FDA Self-Identification Requirements for Generic Drugs. My name is Michelle Couch, a Regulatory Specialist at Registrar Corp in the Drug and Tobacco Department at Registrar Corp and today's moderator. The presentation portion of the webinar will last approximately 45 minutes. We anticipate having around 15 minutes to respond to your questions at the end. If we run out of time, we are also happy to respond to your questions by email. You may submit a written question anytime during the webinar by using the Ask a Question feature in the top center of your webinar screen. A recorded copy of this presentation will be sent to all registrants. I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Melissa Sayers holds a Master of Science degree in Oceanography from Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. She joined Registrar Corp in 2012 and has specialized in drug electronic submission from drug establishment registration, product listings, to electronic common technical document submissions for drug master file and abbreviated new drug application submissions. She has also assisted companies with complying with the registration requirements for human drug outsourcing facilities, self-identification submissions as required under the generic drug user fees amendments. I'd like to go ahead and begin. Melissa? Thank you, Michelle Couch, for the introduction. Okay. okay, so today's webinar, we will provide some background information on the regulation requirements for self-identification submissions and the several types of user fees. Then we will summarize what we have presented and allow time for questions and answers at the end. Some background information on how these requirements came to be for generic drugs. Current federal law requires that a drug be the subject of an approved marketing application before it is transported or distributed across state lines. Because a sponsor will probably want to ship the investigational drug to clinical investigators in many states, it must seek an exemption from that legal requirement. The investigational new drug application is the means through which the sponsor technically obtains this exemption from the FDA. The new drug application is an approval process for the sale and marketing of new drugs in the U.S. to prove that the drug is safe and effective in its proposed uses and benefits outweigh the risks, proposed labeling is appropriate, and the methods used in manufacturing the drugs are adequate to preserve the drug's identity, strength, quality, and purity. An abbreviated new drug application contains data which, when submitted to FDA, provides for the review and ultimate approval of a generic drug product. A generic drug product is one that is comparable to an innovator drug product, which is a new drug application product. So it's comparable in dosage form, strength, route of administration, quality, performance characteristics, and intended use. A generic drug is a drug product that has been approved under an abbreviated new drug application that is comparable to a brand or reference listed drug approved under a new drug application in dosage form, strength, route of administration, quality, and performance characteristics and intended use. These are the drugs on the market that typically cost less to the patient versus a brand name drug.
On July 9, 2012, generic drug user fee amendments of 2012, known as GDUFA, was signed into law by the President as part of the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act, which is known as FDEJA. GDUFA is designed to speed the delivery of safe and effective generic drugs to the public and improve upon the predictability of the review process. GDUFA is based on an agreement negotiated by FDA and representatives of the generic drug industry to address a growing number of regulatory challenges. GDUFA reflects input received during an open process that included regular public meetings, postings of meeting minutes, and consideration of comments from a public docket. Agreed upon recommendations were sent to Congress, and Congress held hearings on GDUFA that included testimony from FDA, the generic drug industry, and other interested parties. GDUFA aims to put FDA's generic drug program on a firm financial footing and ensure timely access to safe, high-quality, affordable generic drugs. GDUFA enables FDA to access user fees to fund critical and measurable enhancements to the performance of FDA's generic drugs program, bringing greater predictability and timelessness to the review of generic drug applications. With the implementation of GDUFA, FDA has the authority to collect fees related to application fees for abbreviated new drug applications, prior approval supplements to ANDAs, a one-time ANDA backlog fee, fees for type 2 DMF referenced in ANDAs, and annual facility fees of manufacturers of generic drugs. Also, manufacturers of generic drugs are required to submit an electronic submission known as self-identification, which helps determine the next fiscal year user fees. GDUFA must be reauthorized every five years. On August 18, 2017, the President signed the bill reauthorizing GDUFA through September 30th of 2022, with some changes to the fee structure that differs from GDUFA of 2012. So, for purposes of self-identification and payment of fees, GDUFA defines active pharmaceutical ingredients, APIs, and finished dosage forms, FDF, manufacturers differently from the way these categories of manufacturers have been defined historically. For example, generic drug manufacturers who mix an API when a substance is unstable or cannot be transported on its own are considered API manufacturers and not FDF manufacturers for self-identification and the payment of GDUFA fees only. The definition for an active pharmaceutical ingredient under GDUFA differs from the definition that applies for drug establishment registration and product listings. Per 21 CFR Part 207.1, an active pharmaceutical ingredient means any substance that is intended for incorporation into a finished drug product and is intended to furnish pharmacological activity or other direct effect in a diagnostic, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, or to affect the structure or any function of the body. Active pharmaceutical ingredient does not include intermediates used in the synthesis of the substance. However, this definition under GDUFA goes more specifically into more than just a substance. It can be a mixture when the substance is unstable or cannot be transported on its own. An API under GDUFA is also a substance intended for final crystallization, P3 
purification or salt formation or any combination of those activities that has it fall under the first section defined above in subparagraph A. For 21 CFR 207.1, finished drug product means a finished dosage form, such as a tablet, capsule, or solution that contains at least one active pharmaceutical ingredient, generally but not necessarily in association with other ingredients in finished package form, suitable for distribution to pharmacies, hospitals, or other sellers or dispensers of the drug product to patients or consumers. Once again, it's a broad definition. Under GADUFA, the definition is more specific because it will determine which facility fee will be incurred. Under GADUFA, facilities, sites, and organizations must electronically self-identify with FDA and update that information annually. FDA calculates annual facility fees for facilities manufacturing or intending to manufacture API of human generic drugs and finished dosage form human generic drugs based on the number of facilities that have self-identified. The following types of generic industry facilities, sites, and organizations are required to self-identify with FDA. Facilities that manufacture or intend to manufacture human generic drug APIs or FDS or both. GADUFA defines a facility as a business or other entity under one management, either direct or indirect, at one geographic location or address engaged in manufacturing or processing an API or an FDS, it does not include a business or other entity whose only manufacturing or processing activities are one or more of the following, repackaging, relabeling, or testing. Separate buildings within close proximity are considered to be at one geographic location or address. If the activities in them are closely related to the same business enterprise, and are under the same supervision of the same local management and are capable of being inspected by FDA during a single inspection. Sites and organizations that package the FDF of a human generic drug into the primary container or closure system and label the primary container or closure system. Sites and organizations then package the FDF of a human generic drug into the primary container or closure system and label the primary container or closure system are considered to be manufacturers, whether or not that packaging is done pursuant to a contract or by the applicant itself. Sites are identified in generic drug submission and pursuant to a contract with the applicant remove the drug from a primary container or closure system and subdivide the contents into a different primary container or closure system are also subject to self-identification. Bioequivalence or bioavailability sites that are identified in a generic drug submission and conduct clinical BE or BA testing, bioanalytical testing of samples collected from clinical BE or BA testing, or in vitro BE testing. Sites that are identified in a generic drug submission and perform testing of one or more attributes or characteristics of the finished drug form or the active pharmaceutical ingredient pursuant to a contract with the applicant to satisfy a current good manufacturing practice testing requirement. These sites are also required to self-identify as well as sites that are testing for research purposes only. These guys are excluded from this requirement. Self-identification is due between May 1st and June 1st of each year.
A separate system for the electronic self-identification of generic industry facilities, sites, and organizations was established for GDUFA. Entities required to register and list under Section 510 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act or Section 351 of the Public Health Service Act. And those who are required to self-identify under GDUFA submit information separately to the respective systems. Each system populates its own database to meet unique requirements and deadlines. The separate GDUFA system uses the same platform and technical standards already familiar to manufacturers required to register and list. Under GDUFA, if a facility fails to self-identify, all FDF or API manu products manufactured at the facility and all FDFs containing APIs manufactured at the facility will be deemed misbranded. It is a violation of federal law to ship misbranded products in interstate commerce or to import them into the United States. Such violations can result in prosecution of those responsible, injunctions, or seizures of the misbranded products. Products that are deemed misbranded because of failure of the facility to self-identify are subject to being denied entry into the United States. Now on the cost of manufacturing generic drugs, GDUFA has user fees that are due upon submission of certain applications and some that are due annually. There are fees that are due annually for manufacturing facilities that are named in approved generic drug applications. Holders of type 2 drug master files are subject to a user fee when named in a generic drug application. The holders of generic drug applications have fees that they are responsible for as well. There are three types of facility fees, an active pharmaceutical ingredient facility fee, finished dosage form facility fee, and contract manufacturing organization facility fee. If considered an API manufacturer, FDF manufacturer, or a CMO, a facility owner is required to pay an annual facility fee. Each person who owns a facility that is identified in at least one approved generic drug submission in which the facility is approved to produce one or more APIs or a type 2 API drug master file referenced in at least one approved generic drug submission incurs the API facility fee. Each person who owns a facility that is identified in at least one generic drug submission that is approved to produce one or more FDFs incurs the FDF facility fee. Some FDF facilities may be qualified as contract manufacturing organizations. Unlike before, some GDFA II, if a facility is identified in one or more approved generic drug submissions to produce both APIs and FDFs, the facility will only incur the annual FDF fee. An annual CMO facility fee is owed by each person who owns an FDF facility that is identified in at least one approved ANDA. Where the facility is not identified in an approved ANDA held by the owner of that facility or its affiliates, the CMO facility fee is one-third the amount of the total FDF facility fee. A facility owner who qualifies as a CMO will owe the CMO facility fee, 
no other facility fee amount will be assessed. GDUSA 2 specifies that the amount of the fee for a facility located outside the United States and its territories and possessions shall be 15,000 higher than the amount of the fee for a domestic facility. The basis for this differential is the extra cost incurred by conducting an inspection outside the United States and its territories and possessions. Unlike GDUSA 2, the owner of a facility incurs a fee when both of the following conditions are met on the facility fee due date. The facility is referenced in an approved generic drug submission, and the facility is engaged in manufacturing or processing an API or FDF. A facility does not incur a fee for being referenced only in pending generic drug submissions under GDUSA 2. If a facility is first identified in an approved generic drug submission after the due date for payment of the facility fee for a fiscal year, the facility is not required to pay the fee for that fiscal year. In most cases, the critical question is whether there is a generic drug submission approved on the due date in which the facility is referenced. If the facility is first identified in an approved generic drug submission after the due date, its owner will owe a facility fee on the next due date. For example, if a facility is first identified in an approved abbreviated new drug application on October 31st, 2019, which would be fiscal year 2020, it will incur facility fees starting in fiscal year 2021. If a facility is identified in an approved generic drug submission on the due date, and that reference to the facility or the drug submission is later withdrawn, the fee will not be refunded. This fee will incur even if the drugs are for non-U.S. market and if the facility is manufacturing only non-generic APIs or FDS but is referenced in an approved generic drug submission. A facility listed in at least one approved generic drug submission incurs annual facility fees as long as it is identified in generic drug submission. Even if the facility has not started commercial scale production of the API or FDF covered by that submission, or if the facility has stopped temporarily or permanently the production of that API or FDF. The facility will cease to incur additional fees if it is no longer identified in any generic drug submission or has stopped manufacturing all APIs and FDFs included by both generic and non-generic APIs and FDFs by the date that the fee is due. Any outstanding fee obligations will, however, remain due. Self-identification does not in or and of itself trigger a liability to pay GDUFA facility fees. Most facilities that self-identify are required to pay an annual facility user fee. These include facilities manufacturing API and FDF contained in human generic drugs. Other sites and organizations must self-identify but are not required to pay the annual facility user fee. These include facilities that solely manufacture Poisatron emission tomography drugs, facilities that are only referenced in applications submitted by state or federal government entities, for drugs that are not 
distributed commercially, or sites and organizations that only perform testing, repackaging, or relabeling operations. Please note that while repackagers are not required to pay user fees, packagers are, in most cases, subject to FDS or CMO facility fees. There are several consequences for failure to pay a facility fee. In addition to what is listed on this slide, all FDS or APIs manufactured in a non-paying facility and all FDS containing APIs manufactured in such a facility will be deemed misbranded. This means that it will be a violation of federal law to ship these products in interstate commerce or to import them into the United States. Such violations can result in prosecution of those responsible, injunctions, or seizures of misbranded products. Products misbranded because of failure to pay facility fees are subject to being denied entry into the United States. Additionally, goal dates will not apply to applications that have already been received, but list facilities for which facility fees are owed. Please note that the fee is an obligation to the United States government and the fa failure to pay the fee may result in collection activities by the government pursuant to applicable, applicable laws. Drugmaster files are used to provide confidential, detailed information about facilities, processes, or articles used in the manufacturing, processing, packaging, and storing of human drugs. Drug master files are generally created to allow a party other than the holder of the DMF to reference material without disclosing to that party contents of the file. FDA reviews the information submitted in a DMF when it is referenced in a drug application. The information contained in a drug master file may be used to support a pre-market submission, another master file, export applications, or amendments or supplements to any of these. Drug master files are most commonly used to support in investigational new drug applications, um, new drug applications which are referenced to NDAs, and abbreviated new drug applications known as ANDAs or generic drug applications. Drug master files are not required by FDA, nor are DMS approved by FDA. Filing a DMS is optional. However, many companies opt to file a DMS because it allows a contract manufacturer to submit the information once to FDA and identifies the holders of drug applications to reference the contract manufacturer's DMF versus submitting the manufacturing process and chemical information in each drug application multiple times. Traditionally, there were five types of DMS that FDA accepted. Type 1 is no longer accepted or maintained. It used to contain information about the manufacturing facilities, specific people, and specific procedures. Now this information may be provided either in a type 2, type 3, or type 4, or if not possible, then a type 5 may be filed. Type 2 is for drug substance, drug substance intermediate, and material used in their preparation or drug product. An active pharmaceutical ingredient, which is referred as an API, is an example of a drug substance. An API is the key ingredient that performs the function of the drug product that by treating, preventing, or mitigating a disease through chemical action. Today, we will focus on type 2 API DMF as this is the type that is subject to a user fee when referenced in a generic drug submission. 
specifically each person who owns a Type 2 API DMS that is referenced on or after October 1st of 2012 in a generic drug submission by any initial letter of authorization shall be subject to a DMS fee. The DMS filing fee incurs when the DMS is first referenced in a generic drug submission by a letter of authorization after October 1, 2012, or by the date that the DMS holder, who is the owner of the DMS, requests the initial completeness assessment, which is performed upon receipt of the user fee prior to being named in a generic drug submission by a letter of authorization. Note that this is not a yearly fee that is incurred. It is a one-time fee. This means when the same DMS is named in another generic drug application, it does not incur the fee again. It is also important to note that the fee does change each fiscal year. Therefore, the fee that is due will be based on the fiscal year that the date that the DMS is referenced in another generic drug submission or the fee is paid. By paying the fee ahead of time, the DMS will then undergo an initial completeness assessment using factors articulated in the final guidance, completeness assessments for type 2 active pharmaceutical ingredient drug master files under the generic drug user fee amendment. This will allow time for the DMS holder to resolve any issues before being referenced. Once the DMS passes the initial completeness assessment, FDA will identify the DMS on the public list of type 2 DMS that are available for reference for generic drug applications. The DMS will be deemed not available for reference. Once the DMS fee becomes due, no generic drug submission submitted referencing the DMS will be received unless the fee is paid and the DMS is deemed available for reference. ANDA applicants that reference a DMS for which a fee is due but has not paid will be provided notification of the DMS holder's failure to satisfy the user fee obligation. If the DMS fee is not paid within 20 calendar days after notification, the ANDA referencing the DMS will not be received. GDUFA 2 includes a generic drug applicant program fee, which is assessed annually. Each company and its affiliates will be assessed an annual program fee depending on the number of approved ANDAs in their portfolio. To determine the fee amount, there are three tiers of the program fee. An applicant holder of 20 or more approved ANDAs incur the large ANDA program fee. An applicant that is has between Six and 19 approved ANDAs incurs the medium ANDA program fee. An applicant holder that holds five or fewer approved ANDAs incurs the small ANDA program fee. The program fee is due on October 1st of the fiscal year. If October 1st falls on a weekend, federal holiday, or a day when the FDA is otherwise closed, then the fee is due on the following business day. Any ANDA approved after October 1st will be included in the parent company's portfolio for the following fiscal year. The program fee is due on October 1st of the fiscal year. If October 1st falls on a weekend, federal holiday or day when the FDA is otherwise closed, then the fee is due on the following business day. 
any NDA approved after October 1st will be included in the parent company's portfolio for the following fiscal year. So just very important to note how these days fall. For fiscal year 2019 through fiscal year 2022, an ANDA shall be deemed not to be approved if the applicant has submitted a request for withdrawal of approval of such ANDA by April 1st of the previous fiscal year. So by April 1st of each year, each person that owns an ANDA or a designated affiliate of such person shall submit on behalf of that person and the affiliates of such person to the agency a list of all approved ADAs owed by such person. And if any affiliate or of such person also owns an ANDA, all affiliates that own the ANDA and all approved ANDAs, basically you just need to make sure the list is up to date by April 1st with FDA. For transfers of ownership, consolidations, and other changes to a company's portfolio, FDA will use the information effective as of October 1st to determine the program fees here. The following are excluded from the program fee. Poisotron emission tomography drugs and applications submitted by a state or federal government entity for a drug that is not distributed commercially. There are three effects if an applicant fails to pay the program fee. If the program fee is not paid within 20 calendar days after the due date, the parent company will be placed on a publicly available arrears list. Any ANDA submitted by the applicant or its affiliates will not be received, and all drugs marketed pursuant to any approved abbreviated new drug application held by such an applicant or affiliate shall be deemed misbranded. So, to summarize, under GDFA 2, the following has stayed. Facilities subject to self-identification are still required to self-identify between May 1st and June 1st prior to the start of each upcoming fiscal year. Drugmaster files are still required to pay a one-time filing fee when named in a generic drug application. Under GDUFA 2, there was some restructure to the fee structure, which allows facilities that manufacture both active pharmaceutical ingredients and finished dosage forms to only pay the finished dosage form facility fee, whereas before, both fees were incurred. There is a new category for contract man manufacturing facilities that manufactured finished dosage forms that pay one-third of the finished dosage form facility fee. There is a new annual fee for generic drug application holders that pay a program fee, and prior approval supplement fee was removed. Registrar Corp can assist you as registering contact and U.S. agent for foreign countries by submitting self-identification for your facilities to FDA, and assist with submitting GDUFA to user fees. We also can assist with master file submissions, whether it is a new master file, converting from a paper to an electronic format, or submitting updates to help maintain active status with FDA. We also assist with maintaining already approved ANDAs with FDA, by submitting annual reports and adverse event reporting. Also, many facilities that are subject to self-identification are also required to register the drug facility with FDA and list its products. This is another way we can assist your company with complying with FDA. Registrar Corp has 18 international offices in addition to its headquarters location in Hampton, Virginia, and has aided more than 30,000 companies across 160 countries. In addition to the service names here, Registrar Corp offers FDA compliance assistance 
for these additional industries, food and beverages, medical devices, cosmetics, electronics, and tobacco. Thank you, Melissa, for that great presentation. Again, I'd like to announce that we will be sending a recorded copy of this webinar and a PDF copy of the presentation to all registrants. We will now open up for questions. You may submit a written question anytime during the webinar by using the Ask a Question feature in the top center of your webinar screen. The first question is, are OTC monograph products, CMO facilities, subject to the facility fee or only generic drugs? Okay. So to answer the question, the facility fee only incurs when the facility is named as a manufacturer of an API or an SES in an approved generic drug application. So if the facility is only manufacturing over-the-counter monograph drug products, um, it would not incur the fee. If, the, if your facility is being named in an approved generic drug application for an over-the-counter medication, that's when um, the facility would incur the, the fee, especially if it's a finished dosage form, and it meets the definition of a contract manufacturing organization, that fee would be incurred. Next question is, an API manufacturer who is self-identified with FDA but not exporting the API to the United States required to pay facility fees? Okay. So to reiterate, to incur the facility fee, you have, your facility must be named in an approved generic drug submission. So as an API manufacturer, if you are currently manufacturing generic drugs or you intend to be manufacturing generic drugs in the upcoming fiscal year, that will start October 1st of 2018 for fiscal year 2019, then you would still self-identify if by October 1st of this year, the first business day, your facility is named in an approved generic drug, then your facility would incur that fee. So even though right now you may not be exporting APIs, um, it's not a matter whether you're exporting, it's not a matter of whether or not you're act actively manufacturing APIs. What's going to trigger that facility fee is your facility being named as a manufacturer of an API or an SDS in an approved generic drug submission on the first fiscal business day of the fiscal year, okay? So I can't stress that enough. Okay, the next question is, is a facility owner required to pay a GDUFA fee if the facility is manufacturing only non-generic APIs or FDFs but is referenced in an in a approved generic drug submission? Okay. So simple answer is yes. Uh, reason behind it is because the facility is named in an approved generic drug submission. You know, as a reminder, it's not the activity itself that incurs the fee, it's the facility being named in an approved drug application that makes the facility subject to the user fee. The next question. Is a facility that is not currently manufacturing an API or FDF required to pay the applicable facility fees? Okay. So a facility listed in at least one approved a generic drug submission incurs the annual facility fee as long as it's been identified in a generic submission. Even if the facility has not started commercial sale production of that API or FDF converted by that submission, um, or even if your facility has stopped temporarily or permanently of that production. The facility will cease to incur the additional fees as long as it's no longer identified in a approved generic drug submission, okay? 
So just a reminder that if you were subject to the fees in previous fiscal years, any outstanding fee obligations will still remain due. Is a facility that manufactures an API excipient mixture or a mixture of two or more APIs used to produce FDFs required to pay an annual FDF facility fee? All right. So generally, manufacturers of API manufacturers are required to pay the annual FDF facility fee. However, GDUFA provides one exemption for fee-paying purposes only to the definition of in-process mixtures as FDF. Um, GDUFA defines an API mixture as an API when it is produced because the API is unstable and cannot be transported on its own. Um, so an example would be when you include an API mixed with an antioxidant for chemical stability. When the API is prone to oxidative degradation or the API excipient mixture for physical stability to help maintain its amorphous form, so that's some examples maybe to help give you a better idea for that situation. Okay. Are packagers required to pay FDF facility fees? Uh, packagers are considered to be manufacturers regardless of whether that packaging is done. Um, pursuant to a contract or by the applicant itself. So such facilities are required to pay annual FDF or applicable uh, CMO facility fees. Repackagers, though, you know, just to clarify, are not required to pay facility fees under GDUFA. Okay. Um are there CMO fees for veterinary generic drug products? Okay. So for today's presentation, we're really focused on GDUFA. Um, so these, the CMO fees that we're talking about in this presentation specifically is only for human generic drugs. So that's a great question. Respect that. Everything we've covered today is specific to generic drugs intended use for humans. Okay. So these CMO fees, fees would not apply if you, your product is for a generic drug product intended for animal use. So that would be an abbreviated new animal drug application. Okay? The next question, is the time for self-identification from the 1st of May till the 1st of July, even if we are going to submit an ANDA in January of the following year? Yes. Okay. So self-identification from the 1st of May to the 1st of June. Okay, not July, June. So you have one month, essentially, to self-identify. And as if your facility is named in an application now or it's intended to be named in an application next fiscal year. The next fiscal year will be October 1st, 2019 until September 30th of, I'm sorry, 2018 to 2019. So essentially this upcoming October to the following end of September is the next fiscal year. So as long as you're anticipating that your facility will be named in an ANDA, that's most likely going to be approved within that time period, you want your facility to be um, self-identified. Now note, if this ANDA is just being submitted, if it is not approved by the uh, first business day of the net following fiscal year, your facility would not incur the facility fee until that ANDA is approved, and as long as your facility is still named in that approved ANDA. So there's a lot of dates. It's a lot in between the calendar. So I understand um, how that can be confusing. So hopefully that helps answer that question. The next question is, do DMF holders need to wait for a new ANDA applicant to request a letter of authorization before the DMF is assessed to be available for reference? Uh, no. DMF holders can pay the fee before a letter of authorization is requested. Uh, the DMF will then undergo an initial completeness assessment. So that's the example where, you know, you 
file your DMS, you can pay the DMS fee, you go through the initial completeness assessment, and upon completion of that, your facility would, um, sorry, the DMS would then be a publicly um, available on that list by FDA that displays the type 2 DMS that have undergone the completeness assessment. So if you have a potential uh, customer who wants to know whether or not you've completed it, you know, they could go online, see your DMS has already met that, and that's, you know, a really great way of doing, using that tool. Um, Will companies be invoiced for fees? Not for the initial payment. Um, invoices are issued out to companies that have not paid their fees on time, delinquent companies as they're referred. They receive an invoice from FDA detailing the information of the user fees that are essentially overdue and how to pay them. Okay, do you need to self-identify if you are a repackager or relabeler? Yes. So if your company is repackaging, relabeling generic drugs, you need to self-identify. Now, as long as you meet the definition of a repackager or relabeler in that essence, um, your facility may not incur the facility fee in that circumstance. Are reduced fees available for small businesses or others? No. Per FDA, the majority of generic companies are small companies uh, that are expected to benefit, you know, greatly from these reductions in the review. So the increased time, you know, lack of how much time it's going to take, you know, historically it took longer, and now under GDUFA, the review process for these applications are much quicker. So the idea behind this is these fees help make that possible. So FDA has not granted like small business reduction of fees. The only closest to it is the contract manufacturing fees for the FDS facility fee in that regard. And once again, that's not based on the size of your company. That's just the fact that you're not the holder of a generic drug application. You need to self-identify if you are a CMO. Okay. So as a contract manufacturing organization, um, you do need to self-identify if the products you're contract manufacturing are products that are part of a generic drug application, okay? Um, whether those drugs are what you're actively manufacturing now or if you intend to be manufacturing drugs that are going to be a generic drug, um, generic drugs in the ADA, then you need to self-identify. My company has recently undergone a name change. Will we owe the fee again under the new company name? That's a great question. Um, you may be able to have the fee transferred to the new company name. Uh, we have assisted companies through this process. Uh, as a reminder, your company's self-identification will also need to be updated. Our company is a holder of an ANDA, and we manufacture the FDF at our facility. Which fee will we owe? Your company would need to pay both fees. As the holder of the ANDA, um, and if your facility is named as the manufacturer within your own ANDA, your company then incurs both fees. What is the facility fee and the DMS fee? Okay, so that's a great question. Uh, the facility fee is going to be dependent on whether you're an API manufacturer, an FDS manufacturer, or a CMO, if you meet that definition. Um, and these are all fees that are publicly available on FDA's site. Um, if you contact us, uh, very shortly we'll display our contact information. We can happily give you that information. Um, so you can have the information for fiscal year 2018. 
um, I'll try to have you ask, like, what are, you know, the amounts in that respect. And part of the reason why I didn't display them is, you know, they're going to change. And for the facility fees, you know, if you incur them for the upcoming fiscal year. The upcoming fiscal year, those fees are usually published between August and September, and we notify our clients when they're published, so they have it, you know, as soon as possible in that regard. Um, so we notify them, let them know that, you know, what the fees are, and if they require assistance to pay, um, you know, we help them get that, the fees over to FDA. So part of the reason why I didn't put that up there is because it's going to be changing, but we can give you the information easily, um, the link to it, and also, you know, the chart that gives you all the fee information. And if you have any further questions on the fees, you know, we're always happy to help in that regard. My facility manufactures both APIs and FDFs for generic drugs. Will my facility owe both facility fees? So as of the fiscal year 2017, um, only the FDF, sorry, that should be 2018. Um, yeah, so this past October is when this all became effective. And only the FDF facility fee will be owed for facilities that are named in generic applications um, as a manufacturer of the API manufacturer of the FDF. So, and it's too many words. In a nutshell, you know, the fee that would be owed is only the FDF fee, okay? But in previous years, if your facility, you know, had owed both fees, the API and FDF, you would still owe both fees even if it had changed for the future fiscal year. All right, we are out of time, but you can send us additional questions anytime by email to info at registrarcorp.com. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for joining us today.